We are in Philippians chapter 2 today. Very, very, very good lesson. <laughs> Especially for people who don't know who Jesus really is. Okay? That's what we're going to be talking about. Alright, so let's start with a word of prayer today. As always, Father in heaven, thank you again for your word. Thank you for the lessons you teach us. Thank you for the information. Thank you for informing us that Jesus is Lord and what that really means. Thank you for all your blessings. Be with us now as we open your word that we may learn more about you and how we are be can be better servants for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Philippians. Chapter 2. You know, last week, slash chapter 1, <laughs> Paul talks about what's happening, you know, and how even in his affliction, the gospel is being spread even to the Roman soldiers, right? And he says, uh, back in verse 29, for to you it has been granted, right, for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, right, so God made it available, right, for them, the Philippians, to believe in him, Jesus, but also to suffer for his sake, right? You know, they know Paul has been persecuted dramatically for his uh, preaching of the gospel, being a Christian, and they shouldn't expect anything less. <laughs> Jesus was persecuted, etc. In our country, you know, we have such little persecution for being a Christian that we have very little appreciation for what that really means. Right? Experience in verse 30 the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be with me, because he's in. Uh, we think he's in house arrest, chained to a Roman soldier, right? And so then he says, if therefore, so therefore, right? In other words, because of all this stuff I just told you, <laughs> right? Therefore, uh, if therefore there is any encouragement, and we're going to go through some stuff, encouragement in Christ, but I want to point out that we are very familiar with the if-then clause in English, right? Well, in the Greek, there are four different versions of if-then. <laughs> I found out. <laughs> I didn't know that. This particular version doesn't really mean if, but it means since. Mm -hmm. So, since, since this is true, therefore, there is you know, if, he says, if there's any encouragement, but it means there is encouragement, right? Encouragement in Christ, right? Now, the word for encouragement is a noun, pakalelsi or something like that. No, paka, let me see, pakaletos, right? And it's used other places to talk about the Holy Spirit. Right? What did Jesus say the Holy Spirit was going to do? You know, he's going to send the helper. The one who comes alongside. Right? You know, and encourages us, guides us, helps us. Right? You know, that's who this is. And the encouragement in Christ, you know, the Holy Spirit in Christ, if there therefore is any consolation of love. And where does love come from? From God. Uh, what did Jesus show us? <laughs> By coming and dying on the cross, he showed us unbelievable love. You know, he died on the cross for us. You looking for Philippians? Yeah, I found it. Okay. Somebody taught me something a long time. I think I was a kid. <laughs> What's that? General Electric Power Company. The P is Philippians, right? Oh, okay. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, <laughs> Colossians. Oh, that's good to know. You know, 
and they come after Corinthians, right? This General Electric Power Company. <laughs> I still remember that. Kind of like we were talking yesterday or the day before about the firing order on the VA, right? One eight four three six five seven two. I still remember that. <laughs> I haven't used that information in I don't know thirty forty years, but <laughs> it's still up there, <laughs> right? Clogging up the brain, right? So any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the spirit, right? How can we? He's talking specifically to the Philippians, but also the church in general. This letter then circulates, right, to the, all the churches. How do we fellowship except we have the love that comes from being in the Spirit, having the Holy Spirit, being in Christ, in other words, right, which is how we get the Holy Spirit. Then we can have tremendous fellowship amongst other believers, okay? If any, affection and compassion. You know, this is kind of like your, uh, they're talking about like your inward parts where your emotions are, right? Affection, compassion. Is that for you or for somebody else? Well, everyone, hopefully. But other people, not you. Affection right. and compassion is for other people, right? Oh, right, yeah. yeah. So, would that be then fellowship? Well, uh, provided by mm -hmm. the Spirit, <laughs> right? Who is given to us by Jesus. <laughs> See how it all fits? Mm -hmm. Right? So, this is the if then statement. Make my joy complete, verse 2, by being of the same mind. All of us need to be of the same mind, right? Maintaining the same love. United in spirit, intent on one purpose, which is? What's the one purpose? Um, to show our love for God. That's number one. Number one, bingo. Right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Right? And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. Right? So this is our purpose, is to obey God in that fashion. Right? There's a good song out now that's called Sim Simply Love Others As You Would Love God. Message is the same over and over. Yeah. Very popular song. Verse 3 Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, right? But with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Now, does he say, don't look out for your own interests? No. Yeah. But he's saying, don't just look out for yours. Look out for others. What, what do other people need? Right? What did Jesus do? Did he look out for his own personal interests, or did he look out for the needs, our major spiritual need, mm -hmm. right? Because we had this huge sin problem, right? And... Let's face facts. <laughs> Even after we're Christians, we still deal with the sin problem, right? Until we get to heaven, we're still going to deal with the sin problem, right? Because we're selfish. <laughs> and he's saying, don't do that, right? What did Jesus say in Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine, right? When they were asking him, this is what we just talked about, you know, about the greatest commandment. In 37, he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And this is the greatest and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. And something interesting when he says, On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Right. Yeah. Everything depends upon that. Right? 
that's what he's saying, you know. And <clears throat> this is uh, kind of summarized. This is credited to C.S. Lewis. But I don't think anybody's found where he actually wrote it down, <laughs> right? But he said, humility, we are to be humble, right? Which, by the way, was not a popular thing in the first century. Slaves were to be humble, mm -hmm. right? Not people, right? Well, that's good to know. That's what they, they believe. But to be humble, you know, as C.S. Lewis apparently said, is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. I'm reading that and I'm thinking, let's see, I would gather that I probably spend 90% of my time thinking about myself. Not 40% or 30%, you know. Most of my time, I think I'm thinking about myself, what I want, what I'm going to do. Oh, sure. Right? Yeah. And he yeah. says, think less of yourself, right? Don't think less of yourself. Just think of yourself less. So you can think of others more. And think of God more. Mm -hmm. Right? If you're going to be filled with the Spirit, you have to be focused on God, not focused on yourself. Mm -hmm. Right? So I think that's a great quote. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself Less. Where are you? Reading? That's verse 4, chapter 2. Chapter 2. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and of okay. course, the quote I gave you is credited to C.S. Lewis, the great Christian author. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. All right. In verse 5, now we're going to talk about Jesus and his example, right? Have this attitude in yourself which was also in Christ Jesus right this is the attitude we should have you know somebody said it this way activate your Christ mindset <laughs> right think like Jesus try to yeah. yeah we still have the sin nature we still make all kinds of problems, you know, sins or issues, problems, things that Jesus didn't do. Uh -huh. Right? He was sinless. I'm certainly not sinless. <laughs> I'm By not. any means. <laughs> I know people who think they are. Yeah. I'm more like Paul. I'm more like the chief of sinners <laughs> than I am sinless. Now, verses 6, 7, 8 are going to tell us about what Jesus did. Verses 9 through 11 are going to tell us about what God did, right? God the Father. So God the Son, Jesus Christ, says, and he says, who, Jesus, the, although he existed, right, in the form of God, he was, the Greek is, he was completely God. Although he was God, completely God, although Jesus was equal with, completely God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Mm -hmm. He decided to do something mind-boggling. God. <laughs> right? We call it the second person in the Godhead of the Trinity, God the Son. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But that's God, together. The three together, that's God, right? The Almighty, okay? He says he, he didn't regard that as something to be hung on to, right? So for the first time in all history, if you can say it that way, since there's no time in heaven, <laughs> right? It's hard for us to grasp, but Jesus created time, right? Created space created all material things, right? It says he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant 
and being made in the likeness of men. Jesus became a man. Actually, initially a baby, right? Born of a virgin. Mm -hmm. Had to be born of a virgin so he would not inherit the sin nature, right? Like we have. Okay? No sin upon him. The sinless man. But he becomes a man. He left his God likeness in heaven. He hid it, right? You remember on the Transfiguration when he showed Peter, James, and John, this is me. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Brighter than the sun, right? <laughs> then all they're like, holy smoke. <laughs> of course, even after that experience, after the crucifixion, they still didn't believe he was coming back from the dead until he came back. Right? So, do we ever have doubts? Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Right? Does God understand that? Sure. Mm -hmm. Does it change the fact that you are saved now and forever for all eternity? No. Once saved, always saved. Period. Nobody can take you out of God's hand. Not even yourself. <laughs> That's great to know. It is great to know. It's great to know. It's such every time I sin, right, which is often, <laughs> to know that God forgives me, right? And I'm still in his hand. He will never let go. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus, right? So he became a man, Jesus, who was God and is still God, but now is also a man. Verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, right, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now, who is he obedient to? God the Father. God the Son came to earth as a man and then was obedient to God the Father, completely sinless. Right? Did exactly what God the Father wanted him to do. Step by step, word by word, for his, all of his 33 years, whatever. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay? Even to death on the cross, he came to die. God came to earth, took on manhood so he could die for my sin and yours. Nobody else has done that, have they? Nobody. There is no other God, first off. Secondly, all these fake gods, are they selfless to the point of dying for you? They know. <laughs> uh -uh. Right? to the point of death on the cross. So what happened then? Therefore, also God, God the Father, highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. What name is that? God. Jesus. Jesus. What well, tells us in the next verse that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth who's under the earth <laughs> if God just specifically tells us there are people under the earth who's there well the devil <laughs> well the Jews believe that was the Sheol right the place of the dead was under the earth maybe it is you know, at least now, until they're sent to permanent hell, right? I don't know. Right. But it's interesting that he specifically points out everybody, alive, dead, anywhere in between, everybody shall confess that Jesus is Lord. Everybody, no matter what you believe today, right? No matter who you put your faith in, no matter what you put your faith in, everybody shall bow their knee and confess that Jesus is Lord. Period. Everybody. 
believers then go on to heaven with him. Non-believers are cast into eternal damnation. Now what's that belief that everyone goes under the earth like the Jews said? Well, yeah, they called it Sheol, right? That they would end up, you know, that's the place of the dead. <laughs> but I didn't know that, that everything was uh, even as Christians or just no. Jews? No, just people in general oh, was their belief. Because they didn't understand the afterlife. They didn't understand that we have a place to go. Uh-huh. <laughs> right? Oh, absolutely. Remember the thief on the cross. Yeah. When he confessed to Jesus, right? And Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Right. Today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? So when he died, where did he go? Paradise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like that. It's mm -hmm. like we're all opened up to that. Yeah, well, as a what, Christian. What denomination is that? that uh, I don't know if it's Church of God or, or whatever. But anyway, I had a patient, a hospital. And her, her family member passed, and I said, Well, today he's with God. And she said, No, he's not. And I thought, <laughs> I'm thinking, she's saying. <laughs> And she said, not until Pentecost, or until no, the second coming. No. And I said, okay. Yeah, some of them believe in this, uh, I forget what they call it, like spiritual sleep, where you die and you just like asleep until the second coming. Yeah, where have I heard that? Uh, I forget which. Is which it Church of God or Church somebody? Of, some, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But. Or somebody, uh, anyway, she believes it, yeah. and I'm not there to. But that's what, uh, you know, Jesus told the thief on the cross, right? Today, yeah. today, you will be with me in paradise. I, I guess I skip over that part. Yeah, yeah. So, Jesus, right, highly exalted, above all, every name, every knee shall bow, everybody shall confess, all the way, even the people under the earth, right? And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Right? Now, that is much more impactful than we think. Jesus is Lord. We say that all the time, right? Jesus is Lord. What did God say about that phrase? Isaiah 42, 8, right? He says... I am the Lord, that is my name. Nobody would doubt that this is God the Father speaking, right? The Lord, the Eternal Almighty speaking, I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to craven images. <laughs> right? I am the Lord. That is my name. And what's the name given to Jesus? Jesus Christ is Lord. So anybody who doubts that Jesus is in what we call the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that is God. Jesus is God. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Jesus is your creator. And we are all accountable to him, whether we want to be or not. And by that, you either accept his infinite sacrifice. One guy called it diocide. <laughs> if God dies, there's no limit to it. Because God is limitless. Right? If we accept his infinite sacrifice, we have infinite eternity, right, with God. If we deny it, if we slap him in the face and say, I don't want it, he'll let you do that. But then you pay the infinite price, eternal damnation. I would call that a very poor choice. 
my opinion. Mm. Right? Okay. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Mm. Besides Jesus coming to pay the price for our sin, he came to glorify the Father. The Holy Spirit comes to convict us of our sin so we would then glorify God the Son mm. and accept his sacrifice. Right? So God is demonstrating his redemptive character through God the Son, Jesus Christ, who is Lord. Right? Verse 12. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, when Paul was with the Philippians, right? But now much more in my absence. You guys get this. I told you, I preached it, you accepted it, you get it. And now what are you doing? You're doing what C.S. Lewis said, right? Humility is not thinking of yourself thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Spending more time thinking of others and how can I be of service, right? Because when you're of service to others, you're of service to God. Right? So he's saying, you guys are, I mean, you, you're amazing because even in not in my presence, much more in my absence, you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, some people jump off the bandwagon when they see that work out, you know, like we have something to do with our salvation. We accept it. That's our work. <laughs> God did it all. It really means to put your salvation to work. <laughs> Helping others. You've already been saved. You've been forgiven. What should we now do with others? First off, preach the gospel. <laughs> Let them know about Jesus so they can be saved. Secondly, how can we help them? How can we be of service to them like Jesus was for us? He died for us. What can we do for them? Right? Both to will and to work his, Jesus' good pleasure. Right? If we're helping others, we're serving God. Now, again, back to where he said, you know, not merely look out for your own personal interest. He, he's not saying you ignore your own personal interest. You got to take care of your stuff, right? But not at the expense of ignoring everything around you. You need to also help out with other people. See what they need. How can I be of service, right? And if we ask the Holy Spirit to guide us in that effort, we'll find all kinds of things we can do. Right? Lynn's got in the habit of giving almost everybody on the corner money. I mean, she sees somebody, she'll, she'll change lanes in order to give them money. <laughs> Well, that's she's trying to help. Yeah, it's got to be of some help. There's a reason why the person is there. Yeah, that's I wait for the spirit to move me, right? And if I don't feel like he's saying give them money, I don't. I don't know what their story is. And then it's like I don't care. <laughs> but she's that way. There's money in her pocket. She has to give it away. It's that simple. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember doing a funeral, and they. That was the way the mood was. And the kids were like, why don't they just go buy uh, some liquor with it? And she said, that's on them. I did my part. Yeah, that's exactly right. What happens next in undo? It's just like preaching the gospel. Your job is to tell them it with as much love as you can, 
period. What happens next between them and God, you have nothing to do with it. You can't convict anybody of their sin. You can't help it, you know, as far as somebody deciding to get saved. and all, That's a spiritual thing. That's not your job. Your job is simply tell them. And then let the Holy Spirit do his thing. We are not God, right? Only God can convict somebody of their sin, a spiritual event, right? You know, you can extend that to just your typical work when you go to work. Your job is to do the best you can to work. That's it. What happens next is up to God. The results are always belong to God. Not you. We think we have to achieve a certain thing, a certain thing, a certain thing. No. You just have to go do your part. That's good to know. Remember what Gertrude says about this, right? And you do your part, then God will do his part. The results are his. Then you don't get overburdened on it. You don't get anxiety. You don't, you know, oh my gosh, this didn't happen, that didn't happen. What? Okay. Mm -hmm. Right? Do you decide the timetable of all heaven and earth? No. <laughs> God does. <laughs> right? So, God is the one who accomplishes things, especially all the spiritual things that we're talking about as far as helping people, right? In 14, do all things without grumbling or dispute. <laughs> right? Do your part. So there's no sense having any kind of a, this, this uh, grumbling. Interesting that in the Greek, do all things without grumbling. That's a private thing. <coughs> That's your private. Arguing with yourself, right? Grumbling, right? Or dispute. That's a public thing. Right? Because, remember, it's God who's responsible. That you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent. Right? Children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. That reminds me, when, when Ben was here with the mother, dear God, anyway, her and I, we got in a spat over something that we were in the committee of, and we were going back. And I'm sure Ben had an earful. <laughs> <laughs> and Ben was so wise. I mean, I was just when I anyway, he called me out of the blue. And he said, Bill, you know how God can get. Shake it off. And he was really apologizing for something that and I'm not saying I was right, it's just the way I perceived it. And it made me stop and think, you know, I'm arguing over nothing really trivial. But he was able to smooth it over and put things in reality. Yeah. We don't need grumbling or dispute. We want to be blameless and innocent. We want to be lights to the world. The city set on a hill, right? Yeah. From the Sermon on the Mount. Because we are in a crooked, are we in a crooked and perverse generation today? Yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? You know, so we need to be the light. And if we're constantly arguing with people about everything, do they listen to you? No. You get into an argument with somebody, even if you win, did you change their opinion? No. No effect. You might, you might look to yourself yeah. and say, oh, I won that debate, by golly. <laughs> right? But did, did anything happen 
of any good, right? So you present the case and let God do the rest. You're not going to change them. You have the same problem at home. You can't change your wife. You can't do it. You have a hard enough time changing yourself, don't you? <clears throat> right? So if you be the best you you can be, and then leave the rest to God. That's his job. Not ours. We're the light. <laughs> right? Holding fast the word of life. Right? So that in the day of Christ, what is that? What's the day of Christ? When he comes back. Second coming and judgment. Right? I may have cause to glory because I did not run in vain, right? Nor toil in vain, right? What I came to you and taught you, you know, I preached to you, you accepted it, and you've run with it now, right? So my efforts were not in vain. Of course, they never are if you're doing what God's called you to do whether you see results or not because you don't see everything with your human eyes do you you don't know what's spiritually happening remember he talks about some will seed some will water and some will harvest i witnessed to a guy at the bowling alley for i don't know 10 years and 10 years later he calls me up so guess what I became a Christian. I didn't harvest. I just, I may have planted seed, I don't know. Maybe I just watered, right? Somebody else the Lord used to harvest, right? Mm -hmm. You know, but we're just to be the light. Like then we go into the, to the bar after bowling and play pool and I didn't drink, <laughs> right? That's not my thing. <laughs> Hasn't ever been my thing. Just a little bit being the light. Telling people about Jesus, right? Being the light. That's our job. Be obedient to God and tell people because who is Jesus? the Lord the name of the Almighty right that's Jesus yeah. Adrian Rogers says what's the last thing you're going to say on your deathbed mm -hmm. and he said Jesus is the Lord that was that <laughs> I was going to say Jesus here I come <laughs> Get ready. Heaven will never be the same. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, that is our lesson, uh, really, in uh, Philippians chapter 2, who Jesus is, the Lord God Almighty. Father in heaven, as always, thank you for your word. Thank you for these lessons. Thank you that your Holy Spirit has empowered us to understand and to accept that Jesus is Lord and to make him our Lord. And Lord, I, I ask anybody, everybody, who would see this video would say, yes, yes, Jesus is my Lord also. I ask that, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, and our God. Amen. Amen. That is our lesson for today. God bless all of you. Have a great week.